Well, here we are. It was likely one of the most anticipated moments of 2015, with the return of Joseph Stain to the Halo franchise, and the return of a beloved character, Urtas Varum, the Halfjaw. And what a way to close the year out. The official summary describes Urtas chasing after some surviving Sanchayum, who have a weapon that threatens the entire Sanghili race. But how is the actual story? Well, from here on out, it's spoiler territory. Click the on-screen annotation to skip to the spoiler-free wrap-up, or check the description box for the time to skip to. For everyone else, this is Halo, Shadow of Intent. Our story opens by introducing one of our main characters, a Sanchayum named Tem Betek, aka the Prelate. He, along with the Minister of Preparation, Boru Anim, and a few Jerohana and Yan Mea, have captured a few Sanghili warriors in order to test out a weapon. What is this weapon? One we've encountered many times before, and one for which the franchise is named a prototype Halo Ring. Contained in a Forerunner installation of some kind, the Mini Ring fires a blinding flash of light. When the San Shayum, Jurel Hanai, and Yan Mea leave what equates to a safe room, they find the test chamber empty. The Sanghili prisoners were sent on their way, not even leaving trace particles. With their test a success, the Minister orders the Prelate to take their one ship and lure the Halfjaw and the Shadow of Intent to them. So let's pause a moment and talk about this prototype Halo Ring. Now, I'm not going to argue against its existence, as that makes plenty of sense. What does somewhat bother me is the bodies of the Sanghili disappearing. The Halos only kill their targets, scramble their nervous systems, but they don't disintegrate them. I know that some visual media out there has implied otherwise, but I think we'll stick to the word of Salentium here. In it, we are told that lifeworkers had dispersed a solute on various worlds, which would cause creatures killed by the array to dissolve into their component molecules. This was to prevent ecological disaster from decaying biomatter. So the question becomes, what exactly happened to the Sanghili? Were they dissolved by a similar solute? I doubt it, since the minister says there aren't even trace particles left in the test chamber. More likely, I think, is that the room has a sort of auto-cleaning feature. The prelate notices at one point that the Jural Hanai don't leave any footprints when they walk across the floor. To me, this would seem to imply that theoretical cleaning system. It's an odd detail to point out otherwise. Either way, it isn't important to the story overall, just a minor thing that bugged me when I was reading through. Anyway, the story continues as we find Urtas Vadum and the Shadow of Intent above the Sanghili colony of Ranello, which had recently been attacked. Along with his aging blade master, Volsaran, Urtas heads to the surface to investigate. Landing at a spaceport, the two make their way to Ranello's largest city. What they find is a battlefield and the scattered corpses of fallen Sanghili, native Dornak beasts, and Jiro Hanai invaders. Investigating further, they find two survivors, the third son of the local Kaiden, himself now Kaiden following the kidnapping of his father and two brothers, and the Kaiden's daughter, Cyan of the Keep, Tool Jaron. As a quick side note, on Ranello and other scarcely populated Sanghili colonies, the normal rules where Sanghili are raised not knowing their fathers are much more lax, a necessity born from the low population. After being informed of what happened to Ranello, Urtas prepares to make chase after the prelate. Before he can, however, Tul Jaran invokes the right of release, the right to seek out her Kaiden's captors, and requests passage on Urtas' ship. Before answering, Urtas recalls the legend of Kel Darsam, the first light of Sanghelios, son of the god Urs himself. According to the legend, Kel was the slayer of legendary beasts, to the point where he had no interest in holding the title of Kaiden, giving it instead to his uncle Orok Darsam. However, Orok was eventually kidnapped by a rival Kaiden, Nesh Radun. When he learned of this, Kel invoked the right of release, infiltrating the enemy keep by himself and liberating Orok. However, as the two stood at the wall of the keep, ready to dive to their freedom in the waters below, Kel was struck by a spear. As he fell to his death, waves of light from Oros struck him, turning Kel into pure light. Now, interestingly, this story has two endings, which set the theme for the novel. In one version, Kel was stabbed by his rival Nesh. In the other, he was stabbed by Orok, the whole kidnapping having been a ruse in order to trap Kel, Uruk fearing the demigod would one day want the title of Kaiden for himself. Back in the present, the Blademaster objects to Tool's request, but Urtas allows it. The Blademaster again tries to protest, but Urtas reminds him of Stolt, an Ungoy ranger commander that serves under Urtas, and notes that if the aging Sanghili can get used to that, he can tolerate a female warrior. Pausing a moment, when we're introduced to Stolt, we learn that he has survived multiple encounters with humans and can hold his own against any Sanghili, enduring their hits until they wear out and finishing them off with his own rather large fists. More impressive, however, is that this Ungoy has gone up against a Spartan and managed to wound it enough to force it to retreat. Gotta wonder which Spartan suffered that loss. Anyway, on board the CRS-class light cruiser Spear of Light, the prelate recalls the day he lost everything. 
When the flood infested Hai Charity, he and the other prelates had been engaging with the Sung Healy. However, as soon as the flood arrived, they moved to evacuate their fellow San Shayum, while the San Hili, led by Urtas Vadum, began their cleansing of the holy city. In his dreams, or rather his nightmares, the prelate strives to save his wife and recently born child, a child he never knew. And each night, though he grows closer and closer, he fails. The nightmare sequence is to me the highlight of the novella and Joseph Staten at his finest. The vivid detail sucks you in and you genuinely feel the tension, the fear, the despair. While the flood certainly helps, the true despair comes from the fact that no matter how hard he tries, the prelate always fails. You cannot help but feel sorry for the guy. This fact is only made worse by the reality of that day. The prelate had received a distress call from the Minister of Preparation. At one time, the prelate was on the roll of celibates, which, if you recall from Halo Broken Circle, is a list of San Shayum that aren't allowed to breed, a list virtually impossible to be removed from. However, the minister offered a chance. Using the sacred promissory, he rewrote Tem's genes, making him into a prelate, a San Shayum warrior. Because of this, Tem was removed from the list. Because of the minister, he had a wife and child. In short, the prelate was eternally indebted to the minister. This in mind, the prelate moved to High Charity Stalk to rescue him. The prelate waited a long time, almost ready to abandon the minister and rescue his family, but just as he was about to, the minister appeared with his Jirohanai guards. When the prelate asked after his family, the minister reported them lost, that all of High Charity was infested. As they made their way towards the Forerunner installation carrying the prototype Halo, the minister promised the prelate revenge against the Sang Healy, the prelate focusing his rage against the Shadow of Intent and her captain, Urtas. Back in the present, Spear of Light, known in Sanghili as Keldarsam Silket, arrives over the Sanghili colony of Duran. There, they wait. As soon as Shadow of Intent arrives, Spear of Light opens fire on one of the settlements before laying a course across the dark side of the planet. Urtas moves along the light side to intercept. When the two ships meet, Shadow of Intent unleashes everything it has. Unfortunately, a local stellar storm disrupts the ship's weapons and shields. It isn't long before Spear of Light moves right next to Shadow of Intent, allowing the Prelate and his Jirohanai forces to board the carrier. While most of his crew engages with the crew of Shadow of Intent, the Prelate and a small contingent of Jirohanai make for the bridge and Urtas. When they arrive, they find Urtas and Soran, but also found they have been pursued by Juran and Stolt. Juran lunges at the Prelate, while Stolt and Soran engage the Jirohanai. The Prelate is able to gain the upper hand when he reveals the fate of Juran's father and brothers, but is stopped by Urtas. The two engage, though Urtas easily gains the upper hand. With his Jirohane all but dead, the prelate attempts to flee, but is caught and knocked out by Stolt and Sauron. When the prelate awakens, he finds Urtas before him. The Spec Ops commander had captured the Spear of Light and discovered where the ship had been, including the sector that contained the prototype Halo, though, as the prelate learns, Urtas did not know what resides there. The Sanghili and Sanshayum talk, Urtas hoping to get anything he can out of the prelate. Over the course of conversation, the prelate reveals he is working with the Minister of Preparation, and Urtas reveals what really happened when High Charity fell. In the lower districts, there had been San Shayum survivors, well after when the Minister had declared the station all but lost. Urtas and the Sanghili tried to rescue anyone they could, but were ultimately forced to pull back and unleash their cleansing beams on the Holy City. As the conversation comes to an end, Urtas reveals that Shadow of Intent is ready to leave for the mysterious location and encourages the prelate to think about who was lying and who was telling the truth. Just like in the Ballad of Kel Darsam, would the spear come from the front, his enemy, or the back, his ally? After the interrogation, Urtas consults Soran and Stolt on the state of their ship. Upon learning that it is all but defenseless and knowing that they're likely heading into a trap, he evacuates the majority of his crew to Duran, leaving only two phantoms worth of crew on board. Upon arriving, the two phantoms, the prelate on board as a prisoner, depart from the shadow, allowing it to drift towards the installation. Not long after, a pulse emanates from the installation. As it hits the phantoms, Urtas finds his mind scrambled. Memories disappear and he forgets, albeit momentarily, how to speak Sanghili. Some Sanghili are only phased like Urtas, while others, such as Soran, are more severely hurt. The effects of getting hit by a halo at just the right distance, it would seem. Taking advantage of the confusion, the prelate steals a plasma pistol, wounds Stolt, and uses the pistol to destroy his foot bindings. After taking advantage of a sword swing from Urtas to free his hands, the prelate escapes from the Phantom and uses his suit's thrusters to make his way towards the installation. On board the Phantom, Urtas has Stolt tend to the others while he and Juran race after the prelate. Upon arriving at the installation, the prelate learns that the minister had tested the halo at low power and intended to move to the Shadow of Intent so it could be used on the Sanghili homeworld. 
The prelate then confronts his superior on the fall of high charity and, when pressed, the minister confirms the truth that Urtas had spoken. The minister had lied, hoping to take advantage of the prelate's rage. Though, as he is now, the prelate is useless to the minister, who intends to replace him with another surviving San Shayum. This part of the story kind of sounds like Return of the Jedi, doesn't it? Anyway, just as the minister has his Yan Mea open fire on the prelate, Urtas and Juran show up, taking down the minister's energy shield and wounding him before engaging with the drones. The minister retreats to the installation's bunker and prepares to fire the ring despite its damaged state. The Yan Mea flee in fear, while the Sanghili finally take notice of the prelate. Admitting that the spear was always in his back, he grabs a grenade satchel, showing his intent to destroy the installation. Urtas gives him a respectful nod before he and Juran depart. With the Sanghili gone and grenades primed, the prelate, Tem, sees a vision of his dead wife and reconciles with her. As the ring continues to power up, he feels the real world slip away and his hallucination become more real, as if he were actually departing on the great journey. The story comes to a close as Urtas relates these events to the Arbiter Thal Vadim from Duran. They discuss the state of his crew, which is recovering, and Urtas notes that the Blade Master, Volseran, wants to discuss the revocation of the ban on female serving, a precursor to certain occurrences in Halo 5. Arbiter has united the Keeks and formed a new alliance, the Swords of Sanghelios. With Arbiter's victories and the death of Jewel Emdama, the Covenant remnants grow desperate. I'm impressed. Arbiter has females in his ranks. War has traditionally been a male's job on Sangelios. Their final exchange is about where to go from here. Having searched through Spear of Light's database, Urtas believes that thousands of Sanchayum survived the fall of High Charity and plans to seek them out, finding out which deserve punishment and which were merely misled, like the prelate. To this, Del agrees, and Urtas, who had felt tired of war throughout the whole novella, finally finds himself renewed. And that's Halo Shadow of Intent, a spectacular novella that explores the fallout of the Great Schism in ways we've never seen before, and, like Broken Circle before it, paints the San Shayum with shades of grey. The story is a wonderful, character-driven narrative that explores the consequences of war for both the victors and the losers in a way that hasn't really been done before. We've seen the fallout of the Covenants breaking, but rarely have we gotten into the heads of those on the losing side. Again, Broken Circle does this a bit, but not to this degree. The themes and parallels to the legend of Keldar Sam certainly help. So, rating time. I'll admit, when I originally finished this novella, I was kind of depressed due to some other events in my life, but having reread it since, I've come to enjoy it much, much more. While it's no Last Ladder Saint's testimony, Joseph Stain has certainly outdone himself. I give Halo Shadow of Intent an 8.5 out of 10. It's damn good, and if you haven't picked it up yet, please do. You'll be glad you did. Well, with this book down, it's full speed ahead for a breakdown of Halo 5's story and lore. I cannot wait to discuss and rip into this, and I know many of you can't wait either. This has been Halo Cannon, and I'll see you next time. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing it around. You are the reason I get to keep doing this, so thank you, profusely thank you. If you want to dive deeper into Halo's lore, head over to the Halo Archive. It's a lore-based community that welcomes everyone from experts to rookies. No matter what your working knowledge, you'll be sure to find a friend and a good time.